Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Dust Suckers. As you know, we are sucking dust in this podcast and we try to bring you the latest things on technology, finance, Bitcoin, stock market, and many more, and much more. Joey, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Despite all the uh, all the uh, things that happened this weekend in uh, in crypto, of course. How have you been, uh, Ramon? What the hell? What a week! Yeah, uh, it's been <laughs> like it's been. Uh, we, we need a lot to talk today. We we're going to cover interesting things. Uh, the weekend has been really okay. Um, not not much on my end, um, but yeah, trying to trying to understand uh, the situation right now. Um, I was meeting a friend in the weekend. And uh, he told me that in your previous episode, you mentioned that this, the real estate market is going down maybe and so on. And uh, he's from Finland and he listening, he's listening our our episodes and he said that in Finland it's not going to be the same. And he was right. So I want to make a mention there. Finland has, a, because of the labor, due to the labor cost and due to the uh, cost of things here and the things you need to do in order to build a house, uh, maybe the market won't crash that far than in other places in Europe mm -hmm. where the construction and the labor is actually cheaper. But yeah, um, thank you for the correction, my friend. Uh, I hope you are now happy. <laughs> but <laughs> let me make, if, if but I I make think, a comment to that. Yeah, of course, ahead. of course. I, th I think he was right. Yeah. Um, so there, there's a couple of things there. We, um, it's, it's pretty similar to what you see with the oil market. When it goes up, it is very often supply driven and when it goes down it's very often demand driven so a lack of demand makes it go down we have the same in the netherlands where we have a huge amount of immigrants coming in every year and and really i'm talking about very big numbers we have a shortage of housing everyone knows that um, students are rejected from universities in utrecht in the, the hague in, in amsterdam because they can't find student housing um, the it's it's always an issue so there's a shortage of housing and still the housing prices are going down, even though there's a huge shortage. Why? Because people simply cannot get mortgages based on their incomes. So even though there might be a shortage, even though production costs might be high for houses and so on, you still need to find a, a, a healthy equilibrium between supply and demand. And that's based on price elasticity. So there needs to be a certain price level which people can afford um, to buy a house and even if they are they all need homes and the production cost is very high still they need to be able to afford it if that's the case in Finland then maybe yes then maybe he's right um, but if there's if the interest rates are starting to make it unaffordable to to young people eventually the market locks basically that's uh, that's actually uh, a very important thing to take into account because indeed the access to credit and the uh, and uh, and the price of the money has been going going up, and um, there's been there's been a lot of uh, families who are already struggling because their their loans uh, have gone from uh, I don't know thousand two hundred to thousand six hundred, and that's uh, already uh, a hell of a, a hell of a money, right? If you if you think about a family and uh, like a stable kind of uh, yeah. income and, and and buying food and paying your bills and you know just a, just a normal family with, who has work and income uh, 500 euros really makes a difference uh, in, in 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 the cost but anyhow um let's go to to our topics today uh, we have uh, very interesting things as we were mentioning just in the opening we have uh, the crypto week which is probably one of the strongest things but we're going to go through also risk management and and how to uh, manage your own finance uh, from the perspective of, of joy who has been like um or you know who he is. He's a fucking master of the finance. Um, no, 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 no. That's, that's, don't, uh, don't, I, we, we're all students. Don't, don't start with that. I know you are. Anyway, so, um, Joey, what's the first thing you want that we mentioned today? We Do we go first with uh, crypto, which is the most maybe hot right now? What do you think? Yeah, I, I think I think that would be a good one to start with. I, I would like to start with uh, something that happened uh, uh, this weekend also, which is uh, a famous crypto influencer, Kobe. Um, pretty much everyone knows him because he's got a huge, he's got more than a half million followers, I believe. Um, and he's, he's one of the legends in, in crypto Twitter. And he's been, he was, uh, there was one movie clip of him 
on Twitter, which basically showed him saying that it's a very important lesson. And, and this is, doesn't only apply to crypto, it applies to every part of the financial market, every asset class. Stay inter if you can stay interested during the boring times and during when everyone gets demotivated and you can still stay interested and still be focused on that market, then you'll be positioning yourself well for the bull market. If you, like so many or like the majority, um, get demotivated, take your money out, start investing in other asset classes because it becomes so boring and because you keep losing on these, on these trades, um, then maybe, yes, you will be missing the bull run. And I think that happens to a lot of people. I have taken the stance myself, talking about risk management, I've taken the stance myself. I basically used this year to build myself a long-term position in cryptos. Uh, I also do some dollar cost averaging, basically. And I just let it sit for two years, probably. And then we'll see what happens. And I'm taking it on the chin. You know, if, if it goes down by 20% from here, I'll take it on the chin. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to be a short-term trader in crypto. It's amazing because um, um, uh, when I got into crypto, I, I I started to understand the the fee these feelings, right? That you are like, wow, the market is going up, and then you start to put money, and that's the wrong thing to do, right? We all went there, we all been there, and and then uh, as you were mentioning, uh, um, I, I'm a person. Sorry, as you mentioned in the first episode, I'm a person who likes to learn, who likes to do the things right. So I, I really deploy a lot of hours into like uh, to learn uh, how to do things and how things works, right? So um, I remember that I done everything possible that I that every everyone does wrong in the stock market or in in, in crypto. I, I did that, and then um, and then I, st I I started to understand that um, hey this is this is a this is a thing that you need to get in. And you need to know when you're going to get out, more or less. You have you need to have a plan there. And if you don't have a plan, a uh, few things will happen. Either you be you become a long long term holder, like whatever it happens, maybe in ten years or in fifteen, you will liquidate your account. That's also okay for many people. But if you want to be able to maximize your your capital and and try to take advantage and leverage the the market situation. You you can learn a little bit of, of trading, and you don't need to be uh, Joey, <laughs> which is a professional yeah. for that. And yeah, but I, I'm what I mean with this is that uh, you just said that uh, maybe in, uh, you you try to build a long position like uh, for the next two years or something. I tell you what's mine. My position now is depends on the next Bitcoin halving, hundred percent. Like I will see what happens there and. If the, the Bitcoin price goes really, really above um, the, the previous all-time high, then I might I might sell close there, or I might sell maybe even 50% of the position and see what happens, something like that. And then I will I will see. But I really think that crypto allows you to uh, if you if you learn a little bit of the market, allows you to rebuild your positions over time with a lower cost. If you know when more or less nobody knows when to sell but you know if you know more or less when to when to take profits and this is something i have learned from you so it's also interesting to 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 double um to underline yeah yeah i agree and i think it also depends on your age so if you're in your 20s you might think you're not busy with your pension, for example, with your retirement. You're busy with other things. And you want to basically, you're in this get rich quick kind of uh, stage of your life, right? Because you, you've, you haven't got it. You don't have the wealth and you want to gain it. So you're looking at taking more risk probably. When you're in your uh, 30s, you do that a little bit less and you start to kind of reduce. That's what pension funds also look at that. They look at, depending on the age group where you are, they look at a different uh, different splits between stocks and bonds. Uh, that's normally what they do with pension funds. They, they advise you to, to, to split it differently. So the older you get, the more you go towards safety. So I'm, I'm 46 now, and, and what I do, I use the crypto profits from 2021. And sure, I've lost some as well because I stayed in the market in January, February, March, 
2022 to some extent. I, I, I did sell from January onward, but it took me way too long to really close my positions. So what I've done is I've taken a lot of those crypto profits and invested them in stocks that generate dividends. And, and that's my way to reduce risk. That also means that I've I'm taking money out of the crypto markets and not adding more money in. I've taken money out and I've got a similar amount or than what I had in 2019, I think. And I've, I'm basically still using the same amount that I had back then. And, and hopefully that will still generate enough profit. Yeah, by the way, you have to... Um... Uh, we, we, you have to explain to our listeners one or, or dedicate one day even one full episode to the um, uh, how is it the, the 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 companies who are paying the best dividends in the world <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because you you teach me about the Petrobras uh, Brazil, uh, Bra Braz, uh, Brazilian yeah. petroleum company and that was insane was it like 50% something last year yeah the the the, the um, yeah. Literally, the, the, the dividends have been unbelievable and beyond what I ever imagined. And Petrobras is one of them, but they're the coal miners, in other, for example. In other words, well. in other words, Joey is sitting in a pile of cash. <laughs> well, I, basically, the dividends are supposed to pay for my daily expenses, right? I mean, that's that's how I work, and because it's also because of the fiscal law. We discussed that before, and I'm looking constantly for stocks that actually have stable cash flows coming in in the coming let's say three years that's why i look at petrobras that's why i look at oil tanker stocks for example that generate incredible dividends i'm not sure about coal miners at the moment i think copper miners will do well so the southern copper is one of them that i that i own uh, that i really like so there's a couple of these companies that generate incredible dividends and i'd like to have as many as possible and a lot of it gets reinvested as well and, and some of it of course gets gets taken out for daily expenses Yeah, I think I think uh, when it comes to, to to reinvest profits, at least in my case, it depends when they come. Because of course, you, you when you when you have uh, when you own stocks, you can watch the the from the stocks who pay dividends. You you check your dividend calendar, so you know that uh, in May you're going to get this much, in in more or less in, in January this much, or in February that much. And basically, uh, for me, it has happened that. Uh, It does depend so much on the moment situation that uh, do I need to put this money uh, somewhere else or do I need to use this money straight away for whatever or do I, or do I don't need it right now? So let, let's yeah. deploy it. And I have been, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more risk taker than, than you sometimes. And I, 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 have, I actually did the opposite. I took, <laughs> I took dividends money into crypto again. So. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's also possible, and it might work out well, and maybe you'll do better than me, you know, but I, I don't like the swings in my portfolio. I honestly, it, it's, I'm, I'm still, I know you're supposed to, to, to leave your emotions out of investing. I know that. But seeing big swings in my portfolio is not something I really enjoy, and I don't think you do either, Ramon. No, to be honest, no. Uh, I like to... To have it as, uh, let's say, as as boring and as nice as possible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, talking about swings, uh, in this week, in, in we we remind to our audience that we are still speaking about crypto because crypto does have an enormous, tremendous, insane influence to the stock market and the rest of the world's economy. So um, we consider in this, uh, as we are the dust suckers, we consider it a, a very important asset class. So. We just want to remind that um, this week, just in the weekend, uh, I have been calculating. I always do this sort of thing. You know, you know me, like uh, inflows and outflows of, like, uh, for example, in 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 the in in, in in coins like, for example, ADA or or Link or Near or um, even even Ethereum uh, in the in Saturday. 5% up, 5% down between like uh, eight and uh, 14 hours difference. Like kind of very, very automate, automated trading uh, numbers. Like when you see it, you are like, okay, so like there is a machine who is mm -hmm. buying right now. Then you see the up, up, up line and you see perfectly they're always the same amounts. And, and my question to you is that like, why, 
why why is always like around a five percent in into into this kind of trading because it does not uh, I think there is not a rule written about uh, how much you you know the this kind of trading strategy that goes up and down and when everybody start to buy because they start to go up then they sell and then they repeat and they repeat and so on so what's what's your take on that well there's this thing called beta uh, in, in in investing or in charting and and we Many investors or traders look at the average volatility of an asset class or a stock or a crypto over a certain period of time. That could be the past 14 candles, for example, if you look at a chart. And that, those, that average volatility is what they look at as a trading range. So if that average volatility is about 5%, for example, then they look at uh, using that range as uh, that historic range as some kind of an indication of what kind of volatility they can expect. And there are certain asset classes that are uh, that have very low volatility, and there's asset classes that have very high volatility. I mean, oil, crude oil, for example, uh, very volatile. So, if you have some historic volatility in those in those ranges, normally you expect that to continue. However, there's something like that also a lot of investors look at is when you have very low volatility, you expect that at some stage when you see a breakout of volatility, you suddenly see higher volatility coming in, then you know you could expect a stronger trend coming up. With crypto, indeed, we see, we see high volatility and uh, a lot of traders are in the market as well. So there's a lot of people that actually use that volatility and, and start buying uh, the support levels and start selling the, the resistance levels. I'm not one to do that, but yeah, there is definitely uh, a lot of people out there that work that way. Absolutely, this is this is super super insightful. The 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 one thing I kind of smell right now is again like with this uh, every single time that there's been this five uh, percent inflows outflows that it, it, it takes like a week or two weeks something like this, then there is something big happening always. Now we come from a from a big um, from a big um, down down mm -hmm. trend after Gary Gensler, the motherfucker Gary Gensler and his uh, amazing SEC team decided to to basically ban the the altcoin trading in in America, and um, and this has been a really bad news, of course, for the for the crypto market. There's been a lot of money flowing uh, into uh, probably stable coins or even out of the market mm -hmm. and I, w I was hoping that that would go to to bitcoin honestly because in the end in the end it's like a more more safe bet but still then you you, you have to put yourself in the position of that people who is holding maybe uh, small amounts of crypto in exchanges that they are not to uh, rename for real crypto holders or real crypto supporters people who really have a lot of money into there and i think most of people happened that it happened for them just what you say that they got bored and they got tired and many people got the money out and that's what the sec wants in the end they don't want the money there they want it in the banking system and therefore control it and uh, tell us what to do afterwards but um one thing that uh, one thing that is uh, now in my head, and uh, I started my sentence with this, I think in the next uh, around a week, more or less, and this is totally my my mm. forecast as a uh, Ramon's uh, future vision paranoid moment <laughs> again. <laughs> uh, you know that I, I I am a sociopath. I I analyze people behaviors and so on and. Every time that this happened, five percent up, five percent down, like over the time, then there is some big move up, and then some Dogecoin, sheep, or or or, or some of those will come up with eventually like a, a twenty percent out of nowhere up, and then yeah. everybody will start to buy. And that when that happens, normally, if if there is nothing else than somebody who just bought a lot, that price can go only by the social noise and the whole shit around can go easily to a 40% easily in the yeah. same day. But if there is something really behind, then then I, I don't know how to like even predict it because that, that's maybe a job of, of you and and probably a part is uncertain also, so mm -hmm. we don't know. But from the social part, what people does when they see in their exchange applications or in the, or in the computer that you see that something has gone up at 20% in one hour, 
that many people buy straight away. And if you are experienced, like uh, I'm not experienced, but okay, three years is already like you get some, you get some something to say. Uh, I have been taking the leverage, uh, taking the leap there and say, okay, I'm going to open a position here and still make it 20% because mm -hmm. there's really like going, uh, making this thing. So uh, as I said, my crazy forecast for this week is going to be that there's going to be some big move in, in, in one week, more or less. We're going to probably see this kind of 5% down, 5% down. And, you know, I have no fucking idea that this is going to happen, but this is what I feel, and this is what I want to share. I want to share it with you, um, Joy. It's, I know it, you. it's it's very well possible. I mean, we are we are oversold. I mean, altcoins especially are very oversold. I just looked at a chart today of altcoins as a, or let's say the altcoin market if you exclude Bitcoin, Ethereum, and stablecoins, and that one is at major support at the moment. It doesn't mean it can't break, but normally major support means that. It's support for a reason. It means that that's where people start buying. If you look at altcoin as a percentage of the total crypto market, you also see that we are at oversold levels on the weekly chart, not on the short term, but in the weekly longer term. Uh, now that's happened twice before in the last cycle, and all of and both those times were very good buy uh, times to buy. So I think altcoins are oversold compared to the rest of the market. Doesn't mean that. Um, we're going to see a major bull market now, but it's, I think in, I agree with you that uh, at some stage we will see downside very limited. And may, uh, when I say limited, I say maybe 10% at the most for altcoins. Um, uh, I don't see uh, in the short term uh, us dropping much further. I think we can see a run and then we can, we can seek further downside. That's possible. But I don't think we have a lot to lose from, from these levels. Yeah, I, I, I remember uh, I was uh, um, I was following very close a um, couple of or I follow a couple of projects very close. Uh, um, I follow HBAR, I follow uh, VET, VeChain, uh, I follow um, Near, I follow uh, Internet Computer, I follow um, what's the other one? Uh, of course, Cardano, I, I follow, but now it seems a little bit hurt. But there's this guy, this Ben Armstrong, BitBoy Crypto in Twitter. Mm -hmm. Uh, that uh, a year ago, I think a year ago, uh, yeah, around a year ago, he said that I'm going to start buying uh, VET, VeChain, when it hits uh, 0.17. <laughs> and it hits like three days ago. So I was trying to find that tweet, and I, I, I wanted, but I don't find it. I don't know if he deleted or something, but he said that I'm, I'm going to start buying that. So, yeah. Um, I, I bought a bit of of of, of it now, and uh, I I was checking the la my last operation. You know, when you in your app, you buy something that you previously sold. There is in some apps there is the for transaction history, yeah. and I sold my uh, vet position around a year ago for nearly eighty four percent more money than what is worth today. <laughs> yeah, so. I was feeling right. Okay, it's eighty-four percent discounts feels pretty good, and then I, I I went for it, and it's the first altcoin I have bought after more than a year in complete silence for me. That I've been either in 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 stables, and then when the crisis of the stables started, then I jumped to Bitcoin like a lot of people, and I I got it um, in an okay entry price. So. It seems uh, uh, when I think about it, uh, a risky adventure. But um, I would like to ask you about risk management. You are, I think, the person who can teach uh, most about this. So um, if you don't want to add anything else from the crypto side, uh, <laughs> please uh, delight us a little bit. Tell us uh, how, to, how to properly manage uh, a portfolio and take into account the risk, or risk management. Yeah, I think it depends very much on your time frame and on your goals. So if you're a trader and there's a couple of a couple of really great traders on uh, on crypto Twitter, especially, then you look at a favorable risk reward ratio. It's actually a reward risk ratio because you look at, for example, three to one. So you have you set yourself a target when you open a position. For example, you say um, VeChain is interesting at 17 cents. 
um, is it 17 cents or is it 0 0.17? Uh, is it one, it's 1 1.7 cents, sorry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you say a V chain is interesting, it's 1.7 cents. And if you'd be a trader, you'd say, okay, I think it can go to maybe two cents, for example. But I want to limit my risk. That, that is basically an upside of uh, three cents. I want to limit my risk to one cent. So then you set a stop loss one cent below your entry. That would have been actually that would have been triggered because we're now at fifteen point fifteen point eight uh, one point five eight cents actually. But that's basically how you look at risk reward from a trading perspective. Now, if you look at it from an investment perspective, it's a little bit different because from an investment perspective you'd look at longer term positions. So you would, for example, what I do with Petrobras, I look at a long-term position, I look at dividends. So then you don't really look so much at risk management. I don't have a stop loss in place for Petrobras, uh, to be very honest. Um, I have a couple of tanker stocks, uh, Okeanos Eco Tankers, Hafnia. Those are my top three positions, Petrobras and those two. I don't have stop losses in place. When it goes lower, I add why because I know I can kind of predict the cash flows in the coming years. I can kind of predict the dividends. I know the dividend policies are amazing. So then risk management is becoming less of an issue for me. If you look at really trading, then you have to have stop losses in place. And one very good advice that I can always give, and I uh, this is also comes from an, a guy that I follow, a Nebraskan Gunner. He's also one of those crypto guys. He said, Good one. Do not, do not enter a position unless you know when you go, what, what your exit level is, basically, or what your, what your risk level is. So you need to, uh, you don't always need to identify where you will sell, uh, at, like, at which profit you will sell, but you need to have identified at which point you will take a loss. That is number one. If you can't identify a proper level, then as a trader, you should stay away from it. But in my opinion, I would say to probably 95% of people out there, you should not be a trader. Trading is something really difficult and only the minority, a small minority of the market actually can be good at it. The rest of them just lose money with it. And the rest of them are probably better off being investors. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me make some one, short, uh, one short intervention. Um, when I realized that trading is like... Uh, next level of complicated was when uh, i i was I, I thought i started to understand a little bit what you were explaining to me which you you are very very good explaining but still uh, everyone's mind has to be ready for the trading not not everybody's ready and um i remember i remember that i i watched one one chart for one whole day mm -hmm. <laughs> i was like I'm talking about two or two and a half years ago or something like uh, in the beginning where we where we met, and uh, I enter a position in in Marathon Digital Holdings. You remember? <laughs> and I I basically opened the position in Ma in Mara in the moment where Bitcoin had also a pretty good price. So when you start to understand your actions as a, as a trader I, and you you know you don't have any any runway because i did not have any runway the only thing that will happen is that you will lose and today my mana position is like now has recovered a little bit but it's like 80 percent down or something it used to be 96 percent down so i'm happy I, I i i got back something and i think it's going to recover finally with the time and maybe next to the halving or something like this in 224 because it's, it's, it's basically 100% or super correlated. I don't know what the ratio will be, yeah. but really, really it's correlated. Yeah, it's like a leverage play on Bitcoin. Exactly, exactly. And that happened because it was something about uh, how to buy, how to invest in Bitcoin without uh, without buying Bitcoin, right? You, you buy uh, uh, Marathon yeah. Digital Holdings uh, stock. Today, the way I approach it after these learnings is that all the... All the things I have learned of trading and uh, in general macroeconomics, I it serves me to open the positions in the time that I feel safe and correct to open it. On my time frames, for example, there is no one which is under four to five years. And I tell you why. Uh, since Corona, since pandemic 2020, and this is not I'm not any you know I'm not any expert. I'm just a guy who likes to make money and I try to learn how to make better and faster money. That's it. So 
in 2020, the world has gone to a completely disaster and we have seen and we have tasted the flavor of vulnerability, how much vulnerable we are as a human beings and how much yeah. control we are. So I really don't think that we are going to make now five years straight without any disaster or any new thing. So that's why my time frame is like maximum four and a half years, something like this. And I might hold something like very, very sure, like insurance stocks or something like that, because normally they are kind of a very, very long term bet and they pay okay dividends. But anything else, like I I really will try to liquidate it in every four years or something like this, if they have been, of course, enough or okay, profitable. And I know how much I can lose from there from the first day. So from that perspective, I'm, I'm happy and I'm really happy that you say that. But how do you, uh, what's the next level of risk management in, in, your, in your position? Do you like, is there the psychology playing a big part there? I, imagine if you have like uh, lost something or there's been some bad year and, and then you, uh, you ended up having that limited money that you say that okay until here i'm willing to lose and now i have it in cash i'm not invested what what you do there or, or what what would be your sort of catastrophic situation move yeah that's 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 the uh, the problem so if if you have a position for four or five years like you do for example you'd be looking at holding it basically you'd be looking at holding it and for example because of dividends but it could also be because you think that in the coming so many years this, this stock will do really well the problem is that that road to growth is normally paved with at least one of those disasters it could be that the russia ukraine situation escalates and includes another country for example it could be that us china becomes an issue it could be that we have a liquidity crisis or a credit crisis. Uh, those have happened several times before. And every 10 years, you get at least one of those situations. That is a situation where you suddenly see the stock markets going down 5%, 10% even. Uh, and sometimes that means that they will, they will close the markets for a bit and let, every, uh, let it calm down. Um, those are situations where... Your this, emotions are closing the cl closing the markets. Does it is this how many times did this have happens in this? Well, they, they, they have uh, they have this uh, they have this maximum uh, level that markets can actually break down. And during a real crash, like I think we had this with 9-11 as well, sometimes they could say, you know, we're going to stop trading for a bit for uh, and then until until everything calms down and then, then we're going to continue again. And, and, and this, has happened, um, this has happened a couple of times. Normally, these are not things that happen very often, of course, so we should not take that into account. But wow. I, I, I do think for, for a situation like, like those, and I think if you look at all the big um, gurus when it comes to cycle theory, I, I'm a real believer in the cycle theory. 2024 to 2032 is that time frame when a war is generally expected. Um, that could be a world war. That could be a, a, a major war in Europe. It could be. It, it could be. It could be something. But this is like a peak in the war cycle, like we've had several times before. And there's a couple of cycles that come together. One is the monetary cycle. So what's going to happen to currencies, for example? One is the war cycle. And sometimes some of those intertwine and they they, they happen at the same time. And, and that's a, a situation that could be really explosive. Now, that's not to say that we should take into account that everything's going to crash because that's not a good situation. But what I do from a risk management perspective is I always make sure that I have some short positions as well in my portfolio. So you actually have long positions. If the market goes up, they will do well. You have short positions that actually look really bearish. Uh, Disney is one of them that I have at the moment. Disney uh, has lost a lot of subscribers. They don't seem to be doing too well. The chart looks like rubbish. Uh, I had Pfizer as a short position in the past. I had uh, Fertilizer uh, short position in the past. So th there's a couple of these that I keep. 
and they normally will do well of course i have a bank in short position and I, I, a lot of people have told me european banks will do incredibly well because they're making good money uh, they don't do the right to the provisions anymore at the moment and i know that something is up something is up and that's why the european banking stocks even despite their dividends despite their the cash that they generate the stock prices are still going down that tells me that the market actually is not comfortable owning those stocks and I'm comfortable shorting them. So that's one of the risk management things that I actually do. Make sure that you always, you're not positioned towards one side, which is up, but also be positioned towards the downside sometimes. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's really interesting to, to learn about the short stocks because everybody knows how to buy them, but not everybody understands how to short them. <laughs> And it's a uh, and it's um it's a really interesting topic. That definitely, we need to maybe uh, dig into this one day about um, you. Maybe you could explain us how to open a short position into against one one company. That would be that would be great. I'm really um, impacted by or <laughs> uh, how, how to say um, I, I, when you say about this uh, 24 to 2032. Uh, Base it on base it on what is this um, prediction in your head, or or where you have got these numbers? Yeah, so um, it's one of the things that I also described in my in my book. Um, basically, it, it, there's there's a couple of things. There's there's cycle theory. You have cycle theory, and then you have cryodynamics. And cryodynamics doesn't look at mathematical cycles, but it looks at occurrences in things. And then you have the cycle theory, which looks at a uh, 50-year uh, cycle, for example, or an uh, eight-year cycle in economics, 10-year cycle in this. And they look at really numerical cycles, basically, and things reoccurring. And we know that there's a lot of examples of things like a banking crisis happening or a uh, weakness in a banking sector is a cyclical, cyclical event. Cryodynamics looks at behaviors of leaders, for example, of um, world powers, They look at imbalance between in populations, so the rich versus the poor. They look at um, things like elites, how many elite jobs are there. So it's, in some cases, there are a lot of elites and a growing amount of, of, uh, of, of people in, 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 uh, in good positions, in, in high positions in, um, that are all looking for more power but there's only a limited position available for them. That's one of the things that some, some of the uh, cryodynamics uh, specialists have talked about. And if you put all those factors together, you'll see that what, where we are now with all the imbalance in society, with how political leaders, weakness in, weakness in political leaders, basically, because we see weak leadership everywhere across Europe. Name me one political leader that is as big as Margaret Thatcher, uh, Even Angela Merkel, you could say, was a, was a strong leader. But we have no strong political leaders in Europe that I can see. And what's going to happen is the left parties have taken it so far to the left, especially with wokeism, which is really a non-event in, in politics, because everyone may, basically only cares about having a good life, having enough money to pay the bills and, and improving their lives. So what you get with the left-wing parties, they've completely messed up. And then you get a swing to the right again in all countries. And you see that in Sweden, we've seen that. Uh, in, I think in, in Spain, you're even seeing that, right? Yeah, it, it, it just happened in Sweden. It happened in Spain. It happened in Finland, where I am. So is I have uh, I have a very funny, um, very funny example for this. And this is, uh, as you all can listen, Uh, Joy is, is the more technical. I'm more uh, like a social, social, social um, uh, behavior person and, and, and psychology. So I was talking to a friend the other day about the, about the politics, and and I said, uh, and this is, doesn't mean that I'm favoring more one side or the mm -hmm. other, but it's just just to understand the picture. Uh, in times when there is uh, left in the power, there is a lot of social benefits. Uh, normally, uh, historically, we come from a moment that there has been enough money in the system and then everybody has money and everybody has uh, food to put in their plate. Therefore, many people becomes like, okay, so if I have enough, I, if I have this much, 
I can still give this much to somebody else who don't have it. And then everybody becomes so uh, good hearted and so, <laughs> you know, uh, open soul and, and, uh, and with the mentality of giving. But when the pictures start to turn upside down, when you don't start to have enough uh, to put your own plate on the table, then there is starting slowly, the, ch the cycle is changing and people end up voting rights and stream rights. And these cycles are like, at least in the Europe I know for the last 30 year, years, it's like eight years, more or less, how it works. It's exactly the same. It happens in first in, 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 in Italy, then it came Sweden, now it came Finland and Spain. Same, same. From total left, uh, nearly communism, to radical rights with the help of classic rights. Always. And this, is, this has been like repeating all over the time. And it's so funny that, of course, there is people who always know what they're going to vote. But we, we need to take into account that there is a lot of people who decide by the sentiment and by, by what they have in that moment and uh, how the government, which is now in the charge, has been performing. Are they happy with their changes? There's people who is extremely pragmatical in that way. So there's not going to be like, you know, there's not going to be pre-taken decisions playing the final role, the, the final decision, you know. Um, but yeah, it's incredible like uh, if you analyze it from this there is another guy i want to talk to you and uh, i think i have mentioned to you but i, I don't remember there's this guy called it samuel benner who used to be uh, an, an american uh, mathematic and agriculture businessman in uh, 1870 something it's from the past century already and apparently he wrote um a, 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 a it's like a, a like a mathematic calculation of the cycles in the economy, but he wrote it as a prediction in 1875. So he wrote from uh, from from that time the panic moments and good times to buy, good times to sell stocks. Have you seen this chart? Yeah, I have seen this, and indeed, that that's one of the good examples of of um, predictability in cycles. And there's also, there's, there's several of those. I mean, there's the fourth turning, for example, which is basically the, every fourth generation does things completely differently because it forgot about the previous generations because the, um, uh, the, 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 the first generation has died and then the fourth generation takes over basically at some stage. So there's a lot of these theories about that and there's a lot of truth in them as well, I believe. And I think if you look at... Okay, I don't, I don't like to talk in right-wing, left-wing, um, because I always think that a lot of the right-wing parties are actually left-wing parties, um, because we consider right-wing, for example, hating immigrants, um, uh, hating foreigners and all that. And, but actually, right-wing is very often, it's, it's actually more uh, looking at creator-centric, or basically looking at building entrepreneurship, and yeah, everyone, so can, yeah, everyone can make their own mm -hmm. success. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of the actual really extreme right-wing parties are actually in their policies are actually very left-wing. Uh, Adolf Hitler, we, we see as a right-wing guy, but actually Adolf Hitler was actually not a, he was a socialist, right? Um, he was a very left-wing guy in his, in his policies. And, it, and it's really hard for people to understand this because many people just take the, the macro data that, yeah, it was a fascist and it was a dictator and that's it. But 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 most of people do not go deep into the study on, on the policies that Adolf Hitler was imposing. And we are not defending him. But what you said, uh, it needs to be understood because many people do not understand yet the differences with uh, left and right policies. I, I, I'm totally, absolutely 200% agree with what you said. And it just happened for me. Um, I also have um, uh, an, a spirit of that everybody deserves the opportunity, and that's quite left thinking. But mm -hmm. I do not, I do not believe, or I do not agree with all what the left generally said. So it's like uh, I, I, I guess like uh, we entrepreneurs, 
investors, macroeconomic people, whatever, stock crypto. We are kind of a different race. <laughs> we don't even have a political group that, that defines us or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think it, it, that's right. I, I, I don't like to place myself in a box. I, I don't like to... Um... Uh, to be honest, I'm not a big fan of democracies. In, in uh, I, I know there's not there's not many better ways to manage a co- to govern a country, but democracies. It's in the end, it's the majority. It's politicians speaking to the majority. You can see the U.S. elections coming up. You know that Donald Trump is going to take a lot of votes uh, because he he basically says what a lot of people want to hear. They want to have something different from Joe Biden, and you can see it happening. And it's going to divide the country even more. And a lot of these things are very predictable. And I think one of the things that all the leaders on the left and on the right have in common at the moment is that there's a lot of shady things going on there. Uh, corruption, um, we, see it, we see it even in the Netherlands where uh, a lot of questions that are being asked, Canada is a good example as well, a lot of questions that are being asked about how the money is spent and they're asked by the opposition. And there will never be an answer to those questions. Because they, they just some, somehow seem to find their way around answering those questions or they give shady answers or they say, yeah, we've lost the receipts or whatever. And so much money is basically lost. And that is a sign of uh, the end of a cycle, basically, where you cannot trust politicians anymore. And, and that's really tough, actually, uh, in a democracy. It's incredible. You just remind me, I was watching one uh, interview, one uh, podcast of Joe Rogan, uh, because uh, Joe Rogan has that much po- po- podcast. Yeah. I haven't been able to see in all of them, but uh, he was interviewing one guy. I Don't ask me what the name was it, but um, somebody who, tell, who told what was the, before the 9-11 in, 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 in New York, um, the day before, uh, some guy from the U.S. Uh, Treasury or, you know, I don't know, some money body uh, was uh, speaking about that there was $2.3 trillion um, that they are, were trying to identify of where they were or something. And the day after, so 12S, not 11S, the 12S, they, they, at least this is what I understood, they run a press conference and one of the topics was that the 2.3 trillion are lost so as you can imagine in that such of a, a sadness environment and and everybody under shock who the hell actually remember that the 2.3 trillion are lost <laughs> so or who, yeah. who, who is going to remember that so that makes you think about the shady things about the why things happen and we don't even know and why political groups are um needs to be taken like like we say in spain like this like with the, just the tiny uh t- fingertips because uh everything might fall like immediately do not yeah. hug it too much because it might it might break insane it's huh scary isn't it yeah i mean if you look at the amount of money that gets lost and it's wasted also during the pandemic uh the contracts that were signed uh to with with the with big pharma for example the, the questions that have been raised in, in, in Dutch government, uh, the questions that have been raised in many, many countries around the world to how was this money spent, for example, and why was this money spent? Normally, you would expect there to be a, a proper analysis of what happened and how can we do things differently next time? Because things go wrong, you know? I mean, it's not like, uh, I'm not saying that people were intentionally wasting money or, or uh, some people have benefited, of course, but... There needs to be this open discussion about whether things have been done right and whether things have been done wrong. And, and I think looking at even even the ECB, um, uh, or oh, sorry, the ECB, the, um, looking at um, the, 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 power, the, the powerful people in, in Europe, actually, and how they benefited from, from certain things, I think that's a discussion we should have. Ukraine is a discussion that is, is being a lot of Americans have at the moment, how do we check whether the money actually goes to the right, you know, to, the, to, 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 to what, it's, what it's supposed to be used for? And, you know, we all feel sorry for the Ukrainians that are there. We all feel sorry for, for, for what is happening in the war. But if you send so much money into a country that is a war zone, 
then how do you check whether that's being used properly? That, th those are discussions. I mean, there's a lot of people in America that are starving. And obviously they're going to say, listen, all that money is going there, but I can, I'm starving, I can't feed my children here. At some stage, you're going to vote for the populist leaders. That's, that's going to happen. Absolutely, absolutely agree. But in the end, in the end, this is all always like a long, this is a very, if this would be, if, if the war thing would be a stock market, like America giving uh, weapons in billions of dollars to countries to defend themselves, it's, a, it's the longest position ever. Just take as an example that uh, um, the UK paid back the war debt that they had with America from 1940s in 2020. <laughs> like 70 years after. Uh, how the hell Zelensky and Ukraine, with all my heart, I'm saying this just from the numbers perspective, how the hell are they going to pay this ever back? Like, I, 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 first of all, they need to win. And first of all, uh, the amount of money that is there is going to be in debt forever with, with America, with the numbers that, that, that they are yeah. laying around. And in the end, what I see also is that with the wars, uh, like giving, giving the right amount of money to defend themselves, if you are supporting them, it should it, it smells to me that it has to be complicated because if you if you don't give then you are not like seen as a whatever a supporter or you just uh, support Russia instead of Ukraine which in the case of America would be a disaster with the Joe Biden in the in the head with Trump would be a different conversation but um, but if you give too much you you're not going to get your money ever or, or or you know it's it is so complicated from the from the strategy perspective but yeah let's see what's let's see what's going to happen yeah it is it is a it's a tough situation and my, my main fear actually having having looked into uh, having read into you know the, the history of the world war 1 and world war 2 for example my one of my main fears is that at some stage this will end up with russia being uh, having to pay a lot of money to Ukraine, uh, like Germany had to do after the World War One, and that will cripple Russia at some stage, and they will have no other way than to start a bigger war, even. And that's what 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 the, what the Adolf Hitler did, of course, in in the Second World War. And we we never really seem to be focused on actually achieving some kind of a solution that is suitable for all. We always want one party to win and one party to lose. And if you do that, the loser always ends up coming back 10, 20 years later and making it worse. Uh, and, and there's so many examples in history of, of this happening. And we are all led by emotions almost, it seems. Media are not helping, of course, but political leaders are doing the same. They're saying, these guys good, these guys bad. It's almost like they're talking to children. And we, we, we are supposed to think critically and say, listen, let's, if you have two children, you, okay, you're, you have two children that are a little bit younger than mine, but if they're fighting and you know that one of them actually did something bad and the other one responded, you're always trying to find a solution and you try to talk to both of them to ensure that they both understand what should have been done here and how do we prevent that from happening in the future. That's parenting, right? That's, oh, that, um, that's like uh, I think that the answer that many people would need to listen in many conflicts in their lives, what you just said. This is like uh, something to really replay and and repeat for 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 one, but for for many things. Uh, what you tell to your children, because what you tell to your children children is the most um, like sincere and the most loving words that you will ever say to any human being. And then you wonder that if I'm telling this to my sons who are human beings, why the hell we don't do, we don't try to do the rest with other human beings? Of course, that's so idealistic from my side, but it does it does make someone think, and I think it's a very very good um, uh, last uh, part of this podcast today. That what you said, I uh, I think we will cut this last uh, uh, 15 seconds glory uh, minute uh, time of, of joy and replay somewhere else. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for everyone who've been listening to us. We are the dust suckers and we've been here another time biting and sucking the dust. Joy, 
do I see you in the next do I see you in the next episode or what? Yes, of course. We will be here on a weekly basis and we'll try to come up with the best uh, topics for the discussion. And we appreciate the feedback from everyone on future topics to discuss. We could, could be investing, it could be human behavior. And we have you in as an expert in body language and, and, and human behavior in a way. So we should use that a little bit more as well. And the interesting part is linking that to the stock market and all that. And we need to do that more often. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. We're going to we're going to uh, cover those things and much more. Thank you very much and see you in the next episode. Bye bye. See you. Yeah, it was fun.